Yeah, after a while I'm back. But just because Milky and Pinky convinced me. Fabio, Fabio, wake up! You have to make a new video! Just five minutes, please. No, it's late, you have to hurry up. Okay, let's go. So far we have tried to clarify, on different levels, what the typical features of the Germanic languages are. And we have also tried, at least I tried, hope it worked, to show the main differences between the East Germanic branch on one side and the Northwest Germanic languages on the other side. Well, now it's time to focus on each single branch before leading you to the discovery of all the languages belonging to this family. We will start with the Eastern branch, that is Gothic. So, are you ready? Let's start! Actually, today we're gonna talk about a single branch, the Eastern one. The only one which is completely extinct. But also about a single language, because, as we have already said, Gothic is the only language of this branch we find written accounts for. Let's start with a very simple question. Who were the Goths? We don't have clear reliable information about the route they took, what we know is that most probably they came, as all Germanic peoples, from an area around southern Scandinavia and the southern shores of the Baltic Sea. Some ancient writers, like Procopius and Tacitus, talk about Germanic tribes with similar names moving from southern Scandinavia to the Vistula area. Then they moved to the area around the Black Sea, and more specifically the Sea of Azov, where two groups can be distinguished, Visigoths the Noble Goths and Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths. The first ones eventually moved to Western Europe, where they messed up a couple of areas. They settled in the Iberian Peninsula until they were annihilated by the Muslims in the 8th century. The Ostrogoths reigned in the area of the Italic Peninsula for something like 60 years, between 5th and 6th century before being defeated by the Byzantine Empire and were consequently culturally absorbed. But the only text we have, even though copied and possibly slightly modified between 6th and 7th century, was the translation of a Bible written during the 4th century by Ulfilas. We've already mentioned him in one of our first videos, he was a goth bishop who had converted to Arianism a version of Christianity that asserts that Jesus Christ was not eternal and immutable like God, but created by him in a second moment, thus also on a lower level of hierarchy. This was very practical and intuitive as a concept. I mean, there is a father who creates his son without too much overthinking about the supernatural, and that's why this religious view conquered the hearts of so many illiterate people. But I don't want to go too deep into religion, I'm not the right person. What is important for us is that we only have one document, and this prevents us to perform a clear analysis of the development of this language. In the 16th century, the presence of another language is recorded. This language then disappeared by the end of the 18th century without leaving written traces. It is called Crimean Gothic, but the truth is that we are not able to identify with certainty if this language was a direct development of Gothic. Some people even question whether Crimean Gothic is actually an Eastern or a Western Germanic language. What we have today of this language is just a list of words that Mr. Auger Ghislain de Busbeck decided to write down during the 16th century. So here we go with the second question. What was the alphabet of the Goths? Like all other ancient Germanic tribes, Goths as well must have used, for a specific period, runic scripts in order to express themselves in specific occasions. But this writing was soon abandoned and replaced by a new alphabet created by Ulfilas, which was based on the Greek alphabet plus some symbols coming from the Latin alphabet and some runes. And the result is something like when you have been stabbed in your living room and decide to write the murderer's name with your blood on the wall. Actually, in this case, the murderer was God.
Today some scholars stick to Alfila's alphabet, but as it is made of symbols which can result unreadable for those who are not really familiar with the study of this language, they often use a Latin transcription as well. Alphilas, who lived in an area of strong Greek influence, could nevertheless not use a pure Greek alphabet, as the sounds of Gothic didn't perfectly match up with those of Greek. And here is another question. What were the sounds of Gothic? Answering this question will take some time, because as you can imagine, in every language we can find lots of sounds, and we want to understand not only which sounds were used in Gothic, but also where they came from, what evolutionary process led to those sounds. And we also have to remember this. If talking about the alphabet is kind of easy, because we possess clear and undeniable information about how the symbols were used, we cannot say the same about the sounds. No one has ever described in a document the sounds of Gothic. No one still alive today has ever heard the Goth speak, nor we have inherited any audio recording of those times. So, the only thing scholars could do was inferring the likely evolution of these sounds by comparing them with the sounds we find in other Germanic languages. But usually both the other Germanic languages and the early, common Germanic language are also completely or partially reconstructed. So, as you can understand, Mistakes are always around the corner, also for experienced scholars. Another important help in reconstructing the phonetic system of the Gothic language are loan words. Remember that the text we're talking about is a Bible, full of references to the Greek Christian culture, with words that didn't have a Germanic translation, so the Goths were forced to copy those Greek words and adapt them to the Gothic phonetic and morphological system. But even in this case, we can't be 100% sure how Gothic speakers decided to slightly modify the original Greek sounds to let them become somehow familiar to their phonological patterns. So, as you can see, it's kind of a mess. Anyway, keeping in mind this uncertainty, we can think that Gothic, as an early attested Germanic language, had preserved quite faithfully the sounds that we think the Proto-Germanic language had. Starting with the vowels, A can be both short and long, following the late developments of Proto-Germanic we talked about in the previous videos. See Proto-Germanic Havianan, Gothic Hafian, to lift. Proto-Germanic Brachto, then Brachto, Gothic Brachta, I brought. Short E and U, which are thought to be pronounced slightly more open than the long ones, that is E and O, are kept in Gothic, like in Proto-Germanic Bringana, Gothic Bringan, to bring, or Proto-Germanic Lustus, Gothic Lustus, lust. But E can also derive from Proto-Germanic short E. See Proto-Germanic Etana, Gothic Etan, to eat. But these two short vowels open respectively to E and O, written respectively as Asa plus Is, or A plus I in the transliteration, and Asa plus Uras, A plus U, when followed by R, H, or H like in Proto-Germanic Berano. As you can see, we have a short E in Proto-Germanic, thus we should have E in Gothic, but we see Gothic Beran, to bear, or Proto-Germanic Duchter, Dochter in Gothic, which means daughter. Many scholars call this phenomenon breaking. Do you remember what breaking is? We explained that in video number 10. It's a vowel splitting into a diphthong, that is two vowels in a row belonging to the same syllable, under the influence of some other sounds. Well, that's not exactly what we see in this language if we assume that the original vowel sound doesn't break into two parts, but it's just a different vowel sound from the Proto-Germanic one. But as we see the same phenomenon in the same conditions in other Germanic languages, like Old English, as a pure breaking, a pure diphthongization, then we can infer that the resulting E and O are just a further evolution of what in a previous stage was a pure breaking. 
But as you can see, when you start overthinking about these reconstructions, things get much harder. And we don't want to complicate things in this course. E and U can also be longer, from the same sounds of Proto-Germanic. See Proto-Germanic we has, Gothic weichs, holy, or Proto-Germanic brukis, Gothic brooks, useful. Please know that long E is written as echs plus Es, that is EI using the Latin alphabet, maybe under the Greek influence. At that time, Greek epsilon iota was pronounced as long E. Also, long E and O, which are somewhat more close than the already mentioned E and O, come straight presumably from the same sounds of Proto-Germanic. Like in Gothic Nehu, near, coming from Proto-Germanic Nehu, or Brothar, brother, coming from Proto-Germanic Brother. So, as you can see, we don't find strong differences from the early Germanic stage, even because, as we have already said in our previous video, in Gothic there are no traces of metaphony. Plus, as you have seen in some previous examples, nasal vowels of Proto-Germanic are completely lost. If we accept the widespread idea that asa plus is, a i, and asa plus uras, a u, had been reduced to a single vowel sound rather than a diphthong, and since these two are the results of Proto-Germanic i and au, then we have to assume that the only Germanic diphthong that survived was Proto-Germanic eu, Gothic eu. Now, if this has to be considered as eu, or as a single vowel, maybe u or u is disputed. New diphthongs arise anyway when u is added to a vowel, like in sneus, snow, but this has to be considered just as a vowel followed by a so-called approximant consonant, w. And what about the consonants? Well, it looks like Gothic is much more conservative than the other languages, even in this case. The sounds are most probably similar to the ones of Proto-Germanic. For example, labiovelar plosives qu and gu were most probably preserved and expressed by quetra or q in the Latin transcription and giva plus wina or g plus w in the Latin transcription. Like in quiman to come from Proto-Germanic quemana or in singuan to sing from Proto-Germanic singuano. Plosive sounds are more or less the ones that were reconstructed from Proto-Germanic, as you can see in the following examples. Proto-Germanic slepano, Gothic slepan, Proto-Germanic hrotan, Gothic hrot, roof, Proto-Germanic stigano, Gothic stigan, to climb, which is pronounced with the fricative sound r, like in Proto-Germanic. Proto-Germanic Badion, Gothic Badi, bed. Gothic also retains germination, that is a possibility to pronounce a consonant with a longer duration, considering it like two similar units in a row. See the word Atta, father or dad. There are some phenomena which are typical of Gothic. The first one is actually a non-phenomenon, that is, there's a process that we find in all other Germanic languages, but not in Gothic. Rhoticism. Proto-Germanic z never becomes r. See Proto-Germanic hausiano, Gothic hosian, to hear. In this word you can see three interesting developments. First, no metaphony, that we find in the same word in English hear, or in German, hören, for example. Second, no rhoticism, that we can see in the same English and German words. Third, we don't find the sound z, like in Proto-Germanic, but s. This is because Gothic doesn't like the sound z, that we find kind of seldom in comparison with the other languages and was replaced with its voiceless counterpart s. Another thing we find in Gothic is the so-called Verschärfung, that is germinated y and w, developed to plosives d and g, like in Proto-Germanic 
Yus, Gothic Wadjus, Wall, and Proto-Germanic Triwis, Gothic Tringus, Faithful. One last typical thing of consonants is that voiced fricatives become voiceless in the end of a word or before final s, like in Proto-Germanic Dagas, Gothic Dachs, Day, whose nominative plural is Dagos, Days or Proto-Germanic Hlaivas, Gothic Hlefs, genitive singular Hlevis. And what was the role of the accent in Gothic? Do you remember we said in video number 5 that Germanic speakers switched from a free pitch accent to a fixed stress accent, almost always falling on the root? Well, this is something we will find in every Germanic language, but as Gothic is attested much earlier, the desinences are slightly clearer than anywhere else, with vowels that are less centralized and more distinct. And we can say the same also for final consonants. And so we come to the next question. What was the morphology of the Gothic language? Even in this case, Gothic is pretty conservative. The uploud pattern is rigid and you can easily understand from the root vowel what class each verb belongs to as you can see from this picture. Fine. Okay, if you want to have a closer look, please stop the video because I need to go on. All classes of nominal and verbal words are preserved. All the original parts of speech are maintained as well. The three Germanic moods as well. About dual, there is a number that disappears almost everywhere. It is preserved in the first and second person of verbs. In fact, we find eight persons in conjugation. See, for example, the verb werpan, to throw. We have the first singular person werpa, I throw. The second singular person werpis. The third singular person werpith. Then we have first dual, that is the two of us, throw, which is werpos. And the second dual, the two of you, throw which is werpatz, but also another form for the first plural person, that is we, more than two people, throw, werpam, you, more than two people, throw, which is werpith, and then third plural, they throw, werpand. The language had reduced the six original Proto-Germanic cases to five. Instrumental was replaced by other cases or by the use of prepositions. Adjectives can be weak or strong, like in Proto-Germanic, to refer to something already well determined or not. And this distinction was pretty important in Gothic, because, unlike the other Germanic languages, there was no article to cover this function. No article at all? Well, there was an ambiguous use of the demonstrative pronoun sa, so, thata, halfway between definite article and demonstrative pronoun, which we can analyze pretty well, as we're talking about the translation from the Greek language, and the Greek language already used both articles and demonstrative pronouns. I can show you here two verses from the Gospels, respectively Matthew 5.15 and John 17.6, whereby the Greek article is translating using the demonstrative pronoun, so we can say that it was slowly evolving into a demonstrative article. The two sentences are in Gothic, in Alphilos alphabet, then once again in Gothic but in Latin alphabet, in Greek, the original one, and then in English. As you can see, in the first example we have in English in the house, and in fact we have the definite article in Greek as well, ente oikia, and in Gothic, as well, we have the demonstrative pronoun used as an article. Thamma is masculine dative singular, because also the noun gards, house, is masculine and in this case it's dative. The second one from John is, and they have obeyed your word. In this case, even if you don't have the definite article in English, but you have it in the original text in Greek, Kaiton logon su teterekan. And that's the same in Gothic. Yachthata word thinata gafaste dedum. 
whereby sata is neuter accusative singular and agrees with word. Talking about verbs, as we have already mentioned in our last video, Gothic is the only language clearly showing reduplication in the strong verbs of the seventh class. Take fahan, to take, from Proto-Germanic fahana, and its paradigm, fefa, fefahum, fahans. Gothic also keeps synthetic forms for present passive. Synthetic means that there are specific desinences to express the passive forms and not, like it happens in the other Germanic languages and in the preterite forms, also in Gothic, through the help of an auxiliary verb. Staying on the verb fahan, we mentioned before, faha means I take, but I am taken is fahada. Fahith is the second plural person, you take, but fahanda means you are taken. But while in the active voice there's a different desence for each person, in the passive voice the same form is extending to all plural persons. So fahanda means also we are taken and they are taken. And it also refers to dual. So as you can see, synthetic forms for passive are already dying in Gothic by Alphilas time, reduced to a smaller number of forms and getting rid of dual that we don't find in a passive conjugation. Plus, as we have already said before, there's no synthetic passive for preterite. In Matthew 27.12 you can find this Yah mithani urohiths was and when he was accused, whereby urohiths, as a past participle of urohian, to accuse, is accompanied by the verb wisan, to be, in the preterite form, to express the passive voice in the preterite tense. Wisan, to be, is used as a help, as an auxiliary verb. Keep in mind that auxiliary comes from Latin auxilium, help, and it's used to build an analytic form, that is a form whereby some of the functions, in this case the passive one, are not expressed through desinences, but with the help of an external word, in this case the verb wisan, to be. Thanks to this example, we could have a first glance on how clauses are built in Gothic. But when it comes to word order and to connections between words and between clauses, then we come to another question. What was the syntax of Gothic? And here there's no clear answer, as Alphilos Bible is a literal translation from Greek. Therefore, it is certainly influenced by the Greek syntax. Judging only from deviation or lack of information from the Greek original, we can infer that the verb was mostly placed by the end of the sentence. If you take the aforementioned example, you can see that was, the fully conjugated verb which shows person and tense, is placed in the end, while in English we say he was accused, with the verb to be in the second place. In John 11.3, you can find Thani Frios Siux ist, the one you love is sick, with the verb in the end as well. And so we come to the last question. Where do Gothic words come from? As you can imagine, since Gothic is a pretty early and conservative Germanic language, most words are Germanic. There's a fairly substantial number of words of Greek origin or filtered by this language, since Goths were in an area of Greek influence at that time, and since the only text is a Bible which was translated from the Greek language. This fact helped us better understand the phonetics of Gothic. So we have, as merely Greek words, Angelus, Ecclesio, Anathema, Psalmo, or filtered through Greek, O Sanna, Nazareth, Gabriel, Smyrn. In this last word we can see that the letter Wina is not used to signify the sound W, but maybe the sound U, as in the original. Just a few other words are considered to derive from Latin, Celtic languages and Slavic languages. Well guys, I hope this could help you better understand the main features of this ancient language, or at least of what we know about it. As soon as I can, I will make new videos focusing on the other branches and on the other languages. That's it for the moment, see you and behave yourselves.